grab your Bibles tonight and turn, if you would, to many places, but to start in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18 tonight. Grab your Bibles, Matthew chapter 18. We're looking at now in our parable series, all the parables of Jesus. We're looking tonight at the parable of the unmerciful servant found in the gospel of Matthew, the unmerciful servant. Very important. We've really got to get this down. And in fact, so much so that if we don't finish tonight, that's okay. Because what's most important tonight is that you and I be convicted by the Holy Spirit. He's the only one who can do this. And then be exhorted by the Holy Spirit. Be admonished by the Holy Spirit. Instructed by him in the word of God that we might obey what is before us. Because this is critical stuff. Matthew 18. I'm going to ask you to hold your finger. Keep your finger there. Mark your spot. As we get into this introduction, it's vitally important. Understand, as we look to the parables, church, that the teaching and the preaching ministry of Jesus was and is given with the sole purpose of a redemptive, listen, of a redemptive, redemptive and restorative nature. That is, the gospel goes out. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the Bible says that through Jesus, the world might be saved. The ministry, the teaching and preaching of Jesus was to bring people to a redemptive understanding of God's mission and God's word. And then a place of restoration. That in a sense that he would bring us back even before, as it were, in the Garden of Eden, before the fall. That we would walk with God again and experience God again. But we've got to get a cancer dealt with in our lives, and that is our sins being forgiven, being born again. And the Bible tells us in John 3, verse 15, you know it, but we don't often read it in a greater context. John 3, 15 says, whoever believes in him, Jesus said, should not perish, that is hell, but have eternal life, that is heaven. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that Whoever believes in him should not perish, that is hell, but have everlasting life, that's heaven. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Notice this. Verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. The word actually means in a state of condemnation. Because he has not believed, trusted, relied upon, put faith in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So the teaching and preaching of Jesus is a redemptive and a restoration message. This is vitally important. Hosea, mark this down by introduction as we get into this parable of the unmerciful servant, the unforgiving servant. Hosea 12.10 says, I have... Also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions, and I have given symbols through the witness of the prophets. Jesus, in his parabolic teaching, is going to bring all these things together. And as we've been saying before, teaching in such a way that it is crystal clear to the open heart, to the, to the willing heart. But to the heart that's not open, the very truth that sets one free, that very truth winds up being a weight, as it were, to pull one down. It all depends on how the word lands in the heart. And I've said this numerous times on Wednesday nights, but I, I say it again, because tonight in the direction we're going, your spiritual maturity and development is absolutely critical. There's nobody exempt from the application of this parable tonight. It's so very critical. That's why there's a ginormous introduction to it, quite frankly. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible tells us God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, verse 2, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. That means if anyone else comes today, for example, preaching some other gospel or contradicting the word of God, listen, the Bible says God spoke to the fathers by the prophets and he has spoken finally, the word means, by his son Jesus. 
So think about it. Every, quote, revelation since the coming of Christ has been nothing but an imposter to what God has said. Vitally important again. John chapter 1, verse 14, the Bible says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten or glorified of the Father, exclusively, by the way, there will not be another, full of grace and truth. We have more verses. Get this, church. It's absolutely important. The parable teaching of Jesus demands our response. In Psalm 78, verse 2, the Bible says, I will open my mouth in a parable, and I will utter dark sayings from of old. God speaking truth and revealing truth. So let's look at this in our study. In Matthew chapter 18, look with me all the way now back just a bit to verse 2. Look at the very beginning, though this is not the section, this is all preparation. In Matthew 18, Jesus is speaking, and he sets it up. He, of course, knows everything. He knows exactly what Peter is going to ask for a moment. We'll come to Peter's question here in a second. But Jesus knows exactly where this dialogue's going. And notice this, everybody. Matthew chapter 18, verse 2. Profound truth. Then Jesus called a little child to him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. That's the setting to what Jesus is about to teach. He's telling us that we need to become like a little child, not childish, childlike. And uh, a child-likeness is a child filled with faith. Children have faith. They're just, isn't it bizarre? To me, that is an amazing testimony of God. A child is born trusting Isn't it tragic to think that there are people who mislead children? In fact, Jesus said, Woe unto those who offend the littlest of these. Listen to this. Anyone who offends a child or misleads a child. Jesus said, In the day of judgment, it will be better for that person to have had a millstone tied around their neck and thrown into the depths of the sea. That's Jesus speaking. Jesus, meek and mild, walking along the shores of Galilee, says, you offend a child. You abuse them. You mess with their heart and their mind and their spirit. And Jesus said, when I get done with you, it would have been better for you to have a 2,000-pound stone tied around your neck and thrown in the bottom of the sea. That is going to be an awesome day. He sets it up. Now look at verse 15. Move ahead. Here it is. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, I'm going to keep reading, keep the verse on the screen. Has anyone ever sinned against you? Can I, can I have a witness? Some of you are lying right now in church. In fact, by the looks of the hands, there's more liars here than not. We've all been sinned against. Listen to this. This is a mandate by Jesus. Go and tell him or her his fault between you and him alone. If he or she hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more. That by the mouth, now he quotes Deuteronomy. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Verse 17, and if he refuses to hear you, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen, like a non-believer, like a tax collector. Assuredly, I say to you, verse 18, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, 
it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For whatever or wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. The context is having a childlike heart in the assembly of the church, that's all of us here tonight, we are to have a childlike heart, yet dealing with the offenses that have been done against us, or we may have offended another, sinned against someone else, that in our childlikeness, we need to deal with these very serious issues. And the church tonight around the world is suffering because we don't, as individuals, obey this portion of scripture. And Jesus is going to speak to us even more about it. We haven't even gotten to the parable yet. This is a big deal. The whole setting is so vitally important. It's deep, and yet it's so common. The answer that Jesus gives us is very deep. The sin is very common. Someone has sinned against you, lied about you, gossiped about you, offended you. Listen. You and I, we have lied about someone else. You say, uh, uh, what? what? I'm making a point not to lie. You and George Washington, I understand that. But here's the deal. There's times when you and I have said things with passion and what we thought was absolute truth and then only later to find out that it was wrong. Boy, is that not happening today in our internet world? Things get out there in a second and then you find out the truth a few days or a few months later. People are quote, quoting others, when in reality, that person is misquoting. The person that they're quoting never said that thing or whatever it might be. People, I told you before, I had someone take my name and send a very belligerent letter to a very world-famous leader in the church, put my name on it, and uh, that man was horribly offended, and thank God he and I got together and I, I got a chance to tell him, I didn't write that. And look, that, uh, that may be happening to you. You may be sitting right here all comfortable, but somebody is sinning, using your name or against you or gossip or rumors. We may not even intend to, but we say things that we ought not to be saying. We say things like, for example, well, we need to, you know, we really need to pray for a, for a, you know, Bobby, and I'm making that up right now. I'm not saying anybody here, no one told me nothing, but I'm making Bobby up. We need to really pray about Bobby, and someone naturally is going to say, well, what about Bobby? Oh, you haven't heard? You hear what I'm saying? Immediately, that goes to sin, gossip. We need to be very careful. I'm telling you, I know we won't get through the message tonight, the next few weeks, it's okay because you know what? If we obey what's being said here tonight in this teaching of Jesus, it may not only revolutionize your life and my life, it could very well lead to a revival in our hearts and in this church. Think about it. If we decide to obey God in this thing, which I believe personally is one of the greatest hindrances to the advancement of the church in our age today is that the church is full of Unrecognized sin, if that's even possible to say. Because we have either said things or we've done things or someone has done something against us and we've not handled it rightly. In verse 21, look at it now. It's, that's, I just gave you the setting. Here's the question. Thank God. <laughs> Peter's so cute. We got, I love this guy. Jesus is teaching what he's teaching and Peter still hung up on verse 15. He's what? Wait, what? 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 <laughs> That's great. He says, remember, verse 15 says, more of your brother's sins against you, go and tell him his fault privately. Peter never heard anything after that. <laughs> we know so much about how we ought to walk because of Peter. Isn't he great? I love that guy. I can't wait to meet him. It's going to be great to meet him. Look, <laughs> look at verse 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Notice the other guys didn't. They're all acting like they knew what Jesus was talking about. <laughs> Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Now, this is huge. 
Because first of all, there's no doubt about it. Peter is thinking, um, I'm going to be very generous now. And I'm going to look real good in front of these disciples and Jesus. So if I know someone, Jesus, who sins against me, do I forgive him <laughs> up to seven times? Here's the answer. Verse 22. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, <laughs> but up to 70 times seven, 490. Some of you are doing the math already. Okay, I, I, I'm really thinking. I'm, I forgave that guy probably about 489 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven, here's the parable begins, verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, by the way, this speaking about the end of the age, who was brought to him, who owed him 10,000 talents. What does that mean? It simply means this. It is an amount, and it doesn't matter what culture. If it's Roman, if it's 2,000 years ago, if it's Roman, or if it's Jewish, in the context, it doesn't matter. Whatever the culture is, the math is a multiple lifetimes. What is owed is multiple lifetimes of giving back. It's impossible. You understand that? You can't, in the scenario Jesus is painting, there's no way that this guy can get out of his debt. Verse 25, but as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold and his wife and children and that all that they had and that the payment be made. Wow. Wow. Sounds like the American economy. Sounds like our debt. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me. Now this is kind of stupid that this guy's even thinking this way. Have patience with me like about a hundred lifetimes worth? It's beyond my ability to pay. I will pay you all. That's impossible. The whole situation's impossible. Verse 27, then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, his buddies that he knew, who owed him a hundred denarii, four bucks. And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down, sound familiar? At his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Verse 32, then his master, this is the generous one you know in the beginning, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I gave you all, I forgave you all of the debt because you begged me. And should you not have also had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers, until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you, each, if you, from his heart, does not forgive his brother his trespasses. This is one of the longest parables. It is certainly, in my opinion, if you could put a priority on them, at least in our culture and our age, one of the most important for sure. Listen, mark this down if you would. Our view and our value of forgiveness, church, as an individual or as a church, is inseparably tied to our hatred and our disdain for sin. If you and I do not hate and disdain sin and understand what sin did to God, then you and I will not have a very big high value or estimation of forgiveness. Does that make sense? Listen. 
When we meditate, and I, and I know we don't often do that anymore, but we need to do that. We need to nurture that. When we meditate on what God has done for us, when we really take it in, stop and pause, and begin to saturate yourself in what God has done for us at the cross, Jesus, the brutality, the torture, the mutilation of innocence at the cross, what he did for us was of such great expense because sin is so hideous and so bad that God endured the punishment because of his great love for you and for me. Can I put it this way in the human term? He tolerated the abuse to gain salvation for you. That's how valuable you are. Now watch, when you and I begin to realize our part, and I think this is the only way that you, you and I can truly experience salvation. That may be a tough thing to say, but hear me out. Jesus Christ is our personal Lord and Savior. I mean, for crying out loud, I heard the other day, passing through a radio station, even the band, the rock band from the 90s, Depeche Mode, said that Jesus was a personal Jesus. If a rock band knows that, you better know that too. He died for the sins of the world. That's true. But that doesn't give you eternal life. That doesn't give you anything until you understand, until I understand that it's my sin that put him on the cross. Forget about everybody else. Forget about the husband or the wife or the stranger sitting next to you right now. Your sin put Jesus on the cross. My sin put him on the cross. Look, I'm glad he died for you, but I'm very, very glad he died for me. And until you understand that he died for you, not in some massive collective sense, but he went to the cross theologically accurate, if you would have been the only child of Adam and Eve and sinned, he would have gone to the cross for you. Well, pastor, I don't know. You know, you, you may be really alluding to some ginormous sins of your own, but I'm not that bad of a person. You're probably lost. You probably don't get it. How can you experience salvation when you've not appreciated the Savior? I put him there. That's what my Bible teaches me. And listen, that's what my conscience bears witness to. I am a sinner saved by the grace of God. And Jesus is saying... This man who had been forgiven such a vast amount of an impossible magnitude of debt then goes out and chokes his co-servant, someone who is a peer, and grabs him and violently grabs him by the throat and shakes him and says, give me my four bucks. <laughs> See, we, listen, here, here's the danger. In this parable, we are going to learn that how God has forgiven us, we are mandated by God to forgive others. And this is now, you feel it already. This is where this begins to get us. Because the temptation for you and I, tonight and the following Wednesday nights together, is the temptation is to not follow God in this one because we'll emotionally think, I know better. I've been hurt so bad that person beat me. That person molested me. That person robbed me. That person took my child or took what? Fill in the blank. doesn't matter. You have to understand something. If you hang with me these next few weeks, you have to understand there may be, you may be on the, on the brink of a radical spiritual explosion in your life because maybe up until now you've completely misunderstood what forgiveness is all about. Forgiveness is for you. Forgiveness is a power. Forgiveness is a liberator. 
And for any of us who, and we've all been tempted to fold up our arms and build up that wall and say, I will not forgive that person. We have missed it. God has given us the ability to forgive that we might be freed from the power of that person's sin against us. Now listen, I have to say this. This is some house cleaning here tonight. There are people, and I know, there are people who attend this church and they come every week. And they live in sin. He's, he, ha, he has his affairs going on or she's got her affairs going on. And then they turn. The, the one who is having an affair turns and says, you heard him tonight. You heard the sermon, didn't you? You have to forgive me. And by the way, you'll have to forgive me next week when I go out with her again or with him again. And you'll have to forgive me the week after that. This, this happens in people's lives who say they're Christians. The Bible says they are not Christians, but they have, in fact, deceived themselves. That's house cleaning tonight. That's church family stuff. I can do whatever I want, and you have to forgive me. Listen, this is not the context of what we're talking about. We're talking about believers here. And by the way, this parable has nothing to do with salvation and having it and losing it. It has to do with fellowship and relationship between brothers or sisters in the family of God. Don't, don't read into this parable what's not to be read into it. This is serious stuff. So we've made it to now point number one. And at this pace, we'll be here for a month the parable of the unmerciful servant, verses 22 to 25, is this church. Be like Jesus. That's what Jesus is inviting us to do. Be like Jesus and be forgiving. Will you write that down, please? Be forgiving. Christians are to be forgiving. We are, un we are unlike all other people on earth. The Christian is mandated to be forgiven. Not because God bends our arm and says, forgive them, forgive them, because I told you to. But the Christian obeys this command to forgive because we lean back upon. Listen, even when our emotions say, I'd rather see that person who hurt me rot in hell and be run over by a truck. <laughs> That's what your emotions say. The Bible, Jesus said, we are to pray for those who spitefully use us. There's no other religion on the planet. There's no other faith in the world that has that standard because God, what's going on? Jesus Christ, God manifested in the flesh, says, listen, you want to follow me? Then you forgive like I forgive. And you say, I can't do it. I agree with you. I can't do it either. It's impossible for us to do it without, listen, without the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. But let me tell you, oh, please hear me. If you tonight begin to have this at least, Lord, I have unforgiveness in my heart toward that person or toward, toward those people or toward that whatever, and I'm asking you, I'm hearing this message, and I'm asking you, God, because I just grinds my teeth, I hear their name, and I just seethe, and I just get angry, and uh, Lord, you know I'm justified. They, they really did this to me. They really hurt me, that if I could, I'd grab them by the neck, and I would shake them. In Jesus' name, I would lay hands on them. <laughs> right? That's, that's how you feel. But God, I'm asking you, listen, can we all do this? This is where we begin. God, I'm asking you, will you make my heart willing to be like Jesus and be forgiving? Amen. Corey Ten Boone, read about her life. Her sister, during the German rise, the Nazi rise in World War II, her sister, when the Nazis came into their town, beat them all up, by the way, and molested them all, but raped her sister to death, the SS. And Corey wound up meeting up years later with some of the uh, abusers. It was in a church service in Europe. Can you believe that? The plan of God. 
And she writes about how she was incredibly filled with the love of God for those SS officers and forgiveness. That's impossible without the work of God. And that's the joy and the beauty of what we're talking about tonight. I can't forgive that person. I can, I can never let that go. Listen, that's true in your humanity. That's right. But listen, God, the Holy Spirit, will give you the power to forgive. And at the same very time that he does that, he will open your eyes to the understanding of how much he has forgiven you. You see, that's the thing. When I begin to understand how much God has forgiven me, now I find that I can turn to those who have offended me and hurt me. This is discipleship, church. I don't care what you say or what, what books you write or what things you preach or what this you're on or what big audience you've got or what group you're in or whatever it is or what your name is or what your status is. You can't, listen, you and I can't do this, then listen, we are not even worthy to bear the name of Jesus. He is forgiving, and he forgives. He's awesome. He refers to himself as a certain king. He answers Peter, listen, seven, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. And he begins now to illustrate by saying there, there was a certain king. As I relate to you regarding the kingdom of heaven, there's a certain king. And he's saying here that, there came time to settle the accounts. By the way, the word implies a king of overwhelming wealth beyond. Well, how do you know? Because, watch this, you, hear the, you even hear the gospel. You hear the gospel in the parable. The man owes the king, the servant owes the master, the king, so much that it would take him a hundred lifetimes to pay him back. That's big bucks. And the master says, I forget, look, I forgive the debt. That means that we're looking at and we're considering the grace of God. How rich is Jesus concerning his ability to forgive? The answer is unlimited. You think Bill Gates has got a lot of money? Listen, what Bill Gates thinks he has in money, God has in forgiveness a billion times innumerable numbers more. There is no sin, hear me out, there is no sin that you and I could have ever committed or commit that is unable to be washed by the blood of Jesus if we repent. Now, I'm not saying go out and sin because his blood will cover. No, 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 you can't do that. But he's that rich. In forgiveness. So there's no doubt Peter is thinking, and this is beautiful, mark this down. You can kind of get inside Peter's mind. He's, listen, Peter's Jewish. He knows the scriptures. And so, you think Peter pulled that number out of nowhere, seven? Oh, no, 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 this is a big deal. Are you listening? Yes. This is fun stuff. In Amos chapter 2, verse 6, the Bible tells us, this is what the Lord says, the people of Israel have sinned again and again, and I will not let them go unpunished. In the Hebrew, it's three times. The children of Israel have sinned against me three times, and I will not let them go unpunished. Why? Because Israel is God's chosen, and he disciplines his chosen. Are you a child of God tonight? Then listen, you step out of line, and God will speak to you. He'll say, don't do that. And you'll say, well, whatever. And then you step out of line again, and he'll say, I'm telling you, don't do that. And you say, well, you know, I got away with it once. It appears I'm getting away with it again. And then you do it a third time, and God says, all right. I mean, I know I'm not supposed to say this, because it's like, I think against the law in California, but he's going to pull out a paddle and he's going to thump you. What's the old saying? He's going to apply the, uh, the board of education to the seat of knowledge. Is that, is that what it is? <laughs> he loves us. 
If you don't get disciplined by God, the Bible says you are illegitimate. That means you may be religious, but you don't belong to God. God punishes his kids. And notice, Peter, being a good Jewish boy, remembering the scriptures, knows Amos 2.6. And he, th- okay, so God, God, God responds in three. Watch this. I'll double that. I'll make it six, and just to be super gracious, I'm going to add one. Seven. And there's no doubt that the rest of the disciples are going, oh, man, Peter, that's awesome. I mean, that is like huge graciousness, Peter. And Jesus who, of course, is en route to the cross, knows the expense of sin. Can you imagine if Jesus died on the cross and somewhere in the Bible it said, I will forgive you seven times. Church, did you hear me? What if the Bible says that God says to us, come to me, I'll save you, I'll I'll take you to heaven, but I can only forgive you up seven times. Eighth time, you're out. Could you imagine? No, Jesus says, no, 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 Peter. Seventy times seven, which again to the Jewish mind means a lot. Has God dealt with the nation of Israel in the book of Daniel, the 490 is very specific number for God dealing with his nation, with his people. But in the context of sin, Jesus is not saying 489, 490, oh no, 491, you're out. No, no, he's not saying that at all. Note this, here's the situation. This is why Peter asks. Remember, he's still stuck in verse 15. If your brother sins against you, hmm, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. Church, listen, this is, Jesus is telling you, telling us, has someone sinned against you? Are you, are you listen, right now tonight, don't, don't jump up and say yes. <laughs> don't say, he's sitting right over there. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> but is there someone in your life that you have not forgiven or they have sinned against you? They've, they've offended you. And God is speaking to you tonight. The Holy Spirit is saying, it's, hmm, person. You will not, I will not spiritually advance. You and I will not grow. We will not have revival in our lives until this is dealt with now. Effective tonight. God is saying to us, you go to that person alone. Do you know what that means? I'll tell, you what it, I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean tweet. It doesn't mean Facebook. It doesn't mean whatever else is out there. You don't tell your neighbor. If Joe has sinned against Fred, Joe and Fred get together. And we're going to learn there's a way to get together. There's a way to do this. And we are hypocrites and we are, we are sinning when we think that we're walking with Jesus and there's this baggage we're dragging behind of unforgiveness towards someone who's wronged us. And we think that we're being used by God or the power of God or whatever's going on in our lives and we've got this trash that we're dragging We were deceiving ourselves. Jesus says, no, no, no. In another place, we'll get to it in a few weeks or months. (laughs) Jesus says, listen, you and your brother have got something going and you're you're at each other's throat. Jesus says, leave your gift at the altar. Don't, Don't come and do some God stuff when this is going on. Jesus says, stop right there. Leave your spiritual actions alone and go settle it with your brother or your sister. 
Isn't it awesome? Do you hear that? Are you a stranger to the Bible? Are you a stranger to God? Hear this loud and clear. Our God is real. He's alive. He's the one and only God. And he's so personal that, and so true and so loving that he says, I don't need your religious trash. I don't need your prayers. Go get along with your neighbor, your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, your grandma, grandpa, your grandkids, whatever it is, your, your boss, your employees. Fix it. This is how real God is. Fix that. Because I'm a relational God. And we need to do that. You say, well, how do I do that? That's what we'll be studying about this whole thing. And Jesus says, listen. He says, if your brother sinned against you, verse 15, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Alone. That's safe, you know. That, that means hum humility. It's a humble setting. You go to him alone. Listen, brother. Did I understand you right? You called... You, you said to, to those guys that, did I understand this right? That I'm a jerk? <laughs> did I hear that right? Give opportunity. No, that's not what I said. Let them respond. How much, of, how much are we boiling with stuff that we heard that somebody said who said? And then you talk to them and you say, what? Man, I got to tell you, that happens to me all the time. First of all, just speaking to people is tough enough in life. Don't you just want to kind of shut down? Pray for like a sore throat. I got land. Just uh, how many of you are married? Raise your hands. You're married. Well, put your hands down. How many of you are single? Raise your hands. Hmm, okay. I'd... All right. I just had a horror. I just had a thought that I was thinking. Hmm, single. Maybe we. Sh maybe all the single people should sit in this section, and then all the. Uh, that has nothing to do with the study. But, because you know, single people want to meet single people. And I'd rather meet, if you're single, you ought to meet a single person at church instead of Joe's Bar and Grill. You know, I mean, it's just a, you catch the kind of fish, you know, anyway. But I, I come, jet lag is in full effect and I've lost total... <laughs> What was I saying before that, that, that rabbit trail? The what? Say what again? Create the atmosphere to speak to them alone, that they're safe. And you, you ask them, is this true? No, it's not true. Or yes, it is true. Or well, you know, and you can talk. Why? Because your brothers in Christ Jesus, both of you should by now understand, I've been forgiven a lot. And so I owe this to my brother and sister to talk to them in a, in a setting that is, first of all, without prejudice, without judgment, without a preconceived, listen, outcome. We are to meet with them to win our brother back, not to win the argument. Will you write that down? That's brilliant. That's the Lord. <laughs> Get together not to win the argument, but to win your brother back to the Lord. You've gained your brother. Privacy. Jesus is commanding that there be an atmosphere of privacy. To maintain an atmosphere why, of restoration. To spare shame and resentment. It diffuses, by the way, the intensity. Prevents gossip. Wow. And by doing so, that does not add to the sin. If someone sins against me or I sin against them, and the moment I take that outside of that circle of sin and I confess it to Clyde or to anyone else, and I say, well, you know what, you know, boy, the other day, whew, you should have been there. Bob just went off. He was just freaking out, cussing and cursing and biting the tree and going nuts, man. And now I've just polluted Clyde's heart. And he had nothing to do with the situation. Look, in my gossip, I have just committed a greater sin 
than what that person did against me. Do you hear that? And the church does this every day. Christians do this every day. And it's gossip. And the Bible says, God says, I hate those who sow discord among the brethren. Wow. In preparing for this message, I, I wrote this down. And if it, if it means something to you, then grab it. Because God gave it to my heart. And if it blesses you, then, then grab it. And it's this. I will never really love someone unless my love is greater than their sin against me. Because, listen, because I do love them, I'm willing then to reach out to them if I love them. So did you get that? I will never really love someone unless my love is greater than their sin. Did you, did you hear that? Do you know, it's, when I heard that in meditation and just, I wrote that down. Gosh, Lord, that is so true. And then it dawned on me. This point is we are to forgive because Jesus, be like Jesus. And that came into my heart, went down on the piece of paper, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. That's the definition of Jesus, is it not? Listen, that he loved all of us so much that his love was greater than our sin. <laughs> wow. I'm going to ask you tonight, right now, we're out of time, just bow your head. And let's just, let's just get our hearts before him. I mean, I'm not into this visualizations of weirdness, but I'm just thinking right now, if I were to reach inside my chest and pull out my heart and hold it up to heaven and God would shine his light upon the deep truth of my heart, here's the question that's in my mind tonight. Am I forgiving people like Jesus has forgiven me? Do I understand tonight? In fact, have I even stopped long enough to consider Which of the centurion's mallet drove the stake into my Savior's hands and feet? What, what hit? What count was it? What number was it of, for which I was responsible for? Was it the first strike? Was it the fifth? When Jesus felt every bit of flesh and nerve and bone and cartilage and vessels being separated and some uh, mangled and some pierced through as that stake went into his hands and his feet. What part was mine? What do I own in that? And the more I begin to realize that and to meditate on that truth and that reality. Number one, I realize that the pain that someone has perpetrated against me begins to dissipate. I'm starting to sense relief. And not only relief, but release. When I begin to see that I'm the guilty one, my finger pointing at that person, that man, that woman. Maybe it's that whatever. I have got to confess that there's been some justification. It's felt good to point. It has felt good to say. Even if it's true, bad stuff about them if I've repeated 
out of my mouth into the ear of, a, of someone standing by. The pain, the hurt, the anger of what someone's done to me. I'm so guilty. And tonight we are here. And Jesus, we ask of you to send the power of your Holy Spirit afresh into our lives that we might forgive those who have sinned against us. And Lord, if we have sinned against someone, that we would now go to them, write them, call them, and humbly, with true humility, forgive and issue forgiveness. And Lord, in these weeks ahead, as we look to this, prime our hearts already, all of us listening right now, either in this sanctuary or those that are watching right now, that we would begin to embrace and begin to romance the reality that you didn't call us to forgive others to set them free. You called us to forgive others to set us free. <laughs> How did we ever mess that up? When we have said, I will not forgive that person or I will not forgive them. Where did we mess that up? Thinking that that was some thing good that that was some power it's bondage it's a crypt it's a tomb it's a flesh eater a sarcophagus of sin it's a root of bitterness God open up our eyes as a church as individuals as husbands as wise as single people as young as old open up our eyes we beg of you, Jesus, tonight. May we right now, even now, begin to be forgiving those that have sinned against us right now. Lord, I'm inviting you. We together are asking you to be so radical in our lives. Father, we praise you. Church, let's just stand and thank him now, please. Let's stand and love on him and appreciate in these words that we sing, appreciate who he is. In Jesus' name.